In part two of our neonatal care lecture series, we're going to talk a little bit about APGAR scoring, neonatal resuscitation, and specific interventions and resuscitation steps that should be taken by the paramedic in the event that you do have to actually employ interventions. Keep in mind that 90 to 95% of all deliveries require absolutely no intervention or very minimal intervention. So when it comes to the neonatal resuscitation algorithm, only five to 10% of any births will be those that will use this algorithm. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the APGAR score. So the APGAR score was developed by Dr. Virginia APGAR in 1953. And this tool helps record the newborn's condition in the first few minutes after birth. So after birth, you would want to get a one minute APGAR score and then a five minute APGAR score. It measures in five different categories, which I find it very convenient that the five categories also form the mnemonic for Dr. APGAR. Appearance, which is gonna include skin color, pulse rate, grimace or irritability, activity, and respiratory effort. So 10 can be your maximum score with a zero being your lowest score. If a score is less than seven, you should redo every five minutes until 20 minutes after birth. If resuscitation is necessary, the APGAR score is done by determining the resuscitation results. So quickly looking at the different categories, for your appearance, if the baby is completely pink, you would assign a score of two. If the body is pink and the extremities are blue, you would assign a score of one. And if the baby is centrally blue and pale, they would receive a score of zero. For your pulse rate, if the initial pulse rate is greater than 100, you would score a two. If it's less than 100 but greater than zero, you would score a one. And if it's absent, you would score a zero. For grimace, also irritability, you're going to rate the, the cry, the reaction. So is the baby crying? If the baby's crying, he or she would receive a two. If we grimace but no cry, then we'd receive a one. And if there's no response, we would receive a zero for this category. For activity, this is measuring muscle tone. An active baby, would receive a score of two. Flexion of the extremities, but minimal action would be one. And if the baby is limp, they would receive a zero. And for respiratory effort, we're going to evaluate not the fact that he, he is or is not crying, but how strong is the cry. If it is a strong cry, we're gonna rate it at a two. If it's slow and irregular respiratory effort, we're gonna rate it a one. And if we have no respiratory effort, then the child will get a zero. The algorithm for neonatal resuscitation shown here should be considered a continuum of care. The interventions outlined in the first 60 seconds or the first minute of care are important to execute quickly and efficiently. They should also be given enough time to work as well. The neonatal resuscitation provider course essentially divides the first 60 seconds of care into two sets of 30. At birth, providers should immediately perform initial interventions of drying, warming, suctioning, and stimulation. Approximately 30 seconds after birth, providers should reassess the neonate's response to these initial interventions. If the response to the initial interventions is inadequate, then it is appropriate to administer supplemental oxygen, position the airway, and or administer CPAP depending on the situation and resources available. After 30 seconds has elapsed, evaluate if this second set of interventions is effective by reassessing the newborn and determine if it is necessary to proceed to more aggressive treatment. These two 30 second intervals of care make up the first 60 seconds of the newborn's life. Finally, it is critical to note that if the newborn does not have adequate respiratory effort and a pulse above 100 beats per minute within the first minute after birth, you must begin positive pressure ventilation. Ventilation of the newborn's lungs is the most important and effective treatment during neonatal resuscitation.
Following current neonatal resuscitation guidelines is going to be the key to adequately and successfully performing neonatal resuscitation. The guidelines that I'm presenting in this lecture are from the 2020 American Heart Association update. As I just recently mentioned, your first 60 seconds are going to be very important. This is where your initial steps, your reevaluation, and ventilation should occur. Ventilation must be started within the first 60 seconds. If the newborn is experiencing inadequate breathing and the pulse uh, is greater than 100 beats per minute within the first minute, we're still going to provide positive pressure ventilations, but we would not start CPR. So your initial steps include reevaluation and beginning ventilation, which should occur within the first 60 seconds. Follow the initial steps of bulb suctioning of the mouth and nose, drying and stimulating the newborn. If the newborn does not respond, further intervention is necessary. Again, assess respiratory rate, effort, pulse rate, and color. Count the respiratory rate and pulse rate for six seconds and multiply by 10 to get your rate per minute. Many newborns have blue hands and feet. This is called acrocyanosis, but it, if they are centrally pink, then we're expecting the hands and feet to pink up as their oxygen saturation continues to rise. If there is normal breathing pattern and a pulse rate greater than 100 beats per minute, but maintains central cyanosis of the trunk or mucous membranes provide supplemental free flow oxygen. If the newborn is still apneic or has a pulse rate of less than 100 beats per minute after 30 seconds of drying and stimulation and oxygen, begin positive pressure ventilations by a newborn size bag mass device. Be careful to not squeeze the bag too hard. You don't want to deliver too much volume which would in turn create barotrauma. Room air is preferred when resuscitating term infants and the addition of supplemental oxygen may not be necessary. Additional oxygen may be necessary if the neonate has not achieved the target preductal oxygen saturation value for their age. But again, remember the neonate is in a transition period so they're not going to appear 100% first with their oxygen saturation. If ventilation and chest compressions do not improve the bradycardia, epinephrine, preferably via IV line, should be given. Also, you may have to consider ET tube or laryngeal mask as appropriate. When no signs of life, which includes pulse or respiratory effort, are present after 10 minutes of resuscitation, there is a very, very low chance of successful resuscitation. Overall outcomes are associated with high early mortality. So just taking a quick look at the neonatal resuscitation algorithm, if you notice here, it is in the form of algorithm where you answer questions and you follow. So at birth, we have to ask, is it term gestation? Do we have good tone, breathing and crying? If the answer is yes, then of course we will just follow routine care, uh, warming, drying, positioning, ongoing evaluation. If the answer is no to any of these questions, warm and maintain normal temperature, position, airway, clear secretions if needed, dry and stimulate. Is the uh, newborn experiencing apnea or gasping? If no, we need to look continually, do we see labored breathing or persistent cyanosis? If the answer is yes, position and clear airway, SpO2, supplementary O2, CPAP is needed. If the answer was yes for apnea and gasping and the heart rate's below 100, positive pressure ventilation, SpO2, and consider ECG monitoring. Now we're going to look at heart rate. Is it below 100 beats a minute? So 100 is going to be your key here, your pivot point. If the answer is no, the heart rate is not below 100 beats per minute and you successfully managed everything else, we will continue to monitor. This will be a post-resuscitation. If yes, check chest movement, ventilation, corrective steps if needed, endotracheal tube or laryngeal mask if needed. Look at the heart rate now, is it below 60? Intubate if not already done, chest compressions, coordinate with positive pressure ventilation, 100% O2, ECG monitor, consider emergency umbilical vein catheterization, then continue this loop, heart rate's below 60, then we'll consider epinephrine, consider hypovolemia and pneumothorax. Now I mentioned the SpO2, so your targeted preductal SpO2. So remember, the newborn is transitioning into life outside of its mother's womb. So it's gonna take a minute for the pressures to build up and for circulation 
to begin to improve and for all areas to actually begin getting a SpO2. So one minute, our preductal SpO2 is 60 to 65. Notice here at five minutes, we're still at 80 to 85 percent. It's not until we get to 10 minutes post delivery that we're going to actually start seeing what we might would consider normal SpO2 levels. So drying and stimulation, after ensuring the airway patency dry and stimulate the newborn, nasal suctioning stimulates the newborn to breathe. Position the infant on the back or side with the neck in the sniffing position. If the airway is not clear, suction with the head turned to the side. Suction the mouth before the nose and stimulate by flicking the soles of the feet and gently rubbing the back. Free flow oxygen can be considered if they're cyanotic or pale and positive pressure ventilation is not indicated. This can be delivered through your oxygen mask, your oxygen tubing. Clinical cyanosis only becomes apparent when five grams per deciliter of hemoglobin is deoxygenated and this will uh, provide with a pale newborn and this patient should get oxygen until a accurate SpO2 reading can be given. Your oxygen flow rate should be around five liters per minute if you're given supplemental oxygen and absolutely do not ever blow oxygen directly into the newborn's eyes. The key here is that we do not want the newborn to become hyperoxemic. Too much oxygen, too much circulating oxygen can actually be toxic for the newborn, can affect their eyes, their vision, uh, can develop free radicals within their blood, and this is counterintuitive to what we're trying to achieve. Other ways of managing, you can consider oral airways. However, there are some conditions that may prohibit or limit the use of oral airways. Bilateral coanal atresia, the Pierre Robin sequence, macroglossia, and craniofacial defect. In all these cases, except bilateral coanal atresia, an ET tube is inserted down a nostril. Keep the mouth open to provide adequate ventilation. So, bilateral coanal atresia is a bony or membranous obstruction of the back of the nose. You'll see here at the back of the nose there is a complete blockage there so obviously you're not going to be able to pass an airway through this way right here. The Pierre Robin sequence is a set of abnormalities affecting the head and face consisting of a small lower jaw which is called micronathia, a tongue that is placed further back than normal this is called glossotosis and blockage or obstruction of the airways most people with Pierre Robin sequence are also born with an opening in the roof of the mouth, also known as a cleft palate. The condition is described as a sequence because one of its features under development of the lower jaw or the mandible here sets off a sequence of events before birth that cause the other signs and symptoms. Specifically, having an abnormally small jaw affects placement of the tongue and the abnormally positioned tongue can blot the airways. In addition, Micronathia and glossotosis affect formation of the palate during development before birth, which often leads to a cleft palate. And note here your cleft palate where you've got an opening in the hard palate. Macroglossia is an enlarged tongue which is going to prohibit the ability to insert an oral airway. Your bag mass ventilation is indicated obviously if the newborn is apneic has inadequate respiratory effort, or has a pulse rate of less than 100 beats per minute after the airway is cleared, obstructions are removed, and stimulation is provided. You have three devices that can deliver bag mass ventilation, a self-inflating bag with an oxygen reservoir, a flow inflating bag, and a T-piece resuscitator. Most often the self-inflating bag is most likely to be used in the field. Always use the in infant size, which is gonna be a 240 milliliter capacity when available. Only one-tenth of the bag's volume will be used for each breath. Remember, we're just trying to get bilateral chest rise. If a neonatal bag is not available, use a bag designed for adults or larger children provided that the delivered breath is appropriately small. Chest rise is monitored for excessive volumes of delivered breaths. Always make sure that your face mask is providing a good seal. Your airway should be patent and the head should be in the sniffing position. The first few breaths after birth frequently need higher pressures, possibly up to 30 millimeters of mercury, and then subsequent breaths should have enough pressure to deliver a visible but not excessive chest rise. Your correct ventilation rate of 40 to 60 is important 
because a higher rate can cause hypocapnia, air trapping, and pneumothorax. Continue positive pressure ventilation as long as the pulse rate is less than 100 beats per minute or the respiratory effort is ineffective. As far as ineffective bag mask ventilation, most of the time it's going to be user error. Make sure you've got a proper mask seal. You've got correct head positioning. Be prepared to suction for copious secretions and also check for pneumothorax or equipment malfunction. Intubation is going to be a last ditch effort. Your indications for intubation is going to be meconium stained fluid, a non-vigorous newborn which is going to have signs of poor muscle tone, bradycardia, inadequate ventilation, or little to no respiratory effort. Routine tracheal suction is no longer recommended for a depressed newborn delivered through meconium stained amniotic fluid. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is known and suspected and respiratory support is necessary. Abdominal organs herniate through an opening in the diaphragm into the chest cavity. Prolonged PPV is needed or craniofacial defects impede an adequate airway. Make sure before you intubate you have all of your equipment available and remember your complications of ET tube placement. Especially in a newborn, oropharyngeal or tracheal perforation, esophageal intubation which is going to lead to persistent hypoxia, right main stem intubation which in turn could lead to barotrauma and you can minimize your risk by ensuring optimal placement of the laryngoscope blade and noting and marking how far the ET tube is advanced. In the event of intubation you may have to consider gastric decompression or even when prolonged bag mass ventilation watch for abdominal distension the abdominal distension is going to possibly impede ventilation because of the pressures putting on the diaphragm. Be very careful when inserting an NG tube, but this is something that may need to be considered. Chest compressions are indicated if the pulse rate remains at less than 60 beats per minute after resuscitation effort. Two people are needed for effective chest compressions and ventilation. You've got two different types. Your thumb technique, if you've got two people, the Hands encircling thumbs technique is a preferred compression mechanism. You also have the two finger technique as well. You want to go one third of the anterior posterior diameter of the, de uh, the chest. Do not deliver simultaneously with artificial ventilation because of the back pressures. Reassess for the presence of a pulse after 60 seconds of well-coordinated chest compressions and ventilations. Limit the number of pauses in compressions, and if the heart rate's above 60 beats per minute, stop compressions and continue positive pressure ventilations. If the rate goes above 100 beats per minute, gradually slow the rate and decrease ventilation pressure. It's important to remember, unless it's a congenital issue, most of the time the reason we're doing chest compressions in the newborn is because of hypoxia so our goal is going to be to reverse the hypoxia and if we can start to reverse the hypoxia then we should be able to focus more on the ventilations and less on chest compressions vascular access the umbilical vein can be catheter catheterized a low UV line into the umbilical vein can be placed. Emergent access is necessary for fluid administration to support circulation, IV resuscitation medication, and therapeutic drugs. It's going to be important if we are placing an umbilical vein line to clean the core with antiseptic, septic, drape the area with sterile towels, keep the stump exposed, place a sterile tie firmly around the base of the core to control bleeding. Attach a 3 milliliter syringe and stop cock to a sterile 3.5 French to 5 French umbilical vein. Line, catheter, and pre-fill, turning the stop cock to off towards the patient. Cut the cord with a scalpel between the clamp and the cord tie, keeping about 1 to 2 centimeters from the skin. And for the low UV line into the umbilical vein, insert the catheter into this vein for a distance of 0.75 to 1.5 inches or 2 to 4 centimeters, maybe a little less in preterm newborns until blood can be aspirated. You got to be very careful though because you can actually advance this into the liver and cause irreversible damage. It can also be advanced into the heart and that may cause dysrhythmias. Flush the catheter with 0.5 milliliters of normal saline and tape into place. A peripheral IV or IO line can be used, but a smaller needle should be used in newborns. And then if you need to get into pharmacological interventions, these are rarely needed. Epinephrine is going to be the most likely drug that you would use in this situation. Remember, all medication dosages are based on weight, and you will follow the most current algorithm and guidelines. Drugs will be talked about more as the course progresses. This is the end of 
part two. If you've got any questions, email me at nickray at suscc.edu.